we're going to talk about new resources that are coming available from PALS on returning to work and building a meaningful life after, after limb loss and limb difference. And then we're also going to uh, have someone from the Amputee Coalition talk about Amputee Coalition and other national resources that can help you determine whether returning to work is right for you and some ideas and resources on my assistance in doing that. And then we'll have at the end, as I said, some opportunity for discussion and feedback with you all in the chat on the side. So you, you type in the chat, we'll read some of those things out loud and then we'll talk about them amongst the panel and then we'll hear more from the chat. Well, as you all know, the number of people living with limb loss and limb difference is is high and it's increasing. And it's increasing because people are living longer. We are saving people after trauma more. And people who are born with limb difference, th those people are living longer as well. So we're having more people living with limb loss in our community. We know that the quality of life after limb loss varies a great deal, but we know things such as pain and depression are problems and managing those problems improves quality of life. And but we also know that people with high self-efficacy who have good problem solving have better quality of life. And so we know that when we improve these secondary conditions and build efficacy and resilience, both activity and participation in life can increase. Next slide. So, as many of you know who have done PALS, you know that PALS is grounded in the idea of self-management. And that recognizes, this is a way of thinking about healthcare maybe a little bit different. I think many of us were brought up with the idea is I have a problem, I go to my doctor, the doctor fixes it, or the nurse fixes it, or the PT fixes it. Well, in fact, in, in health conditions like limb loss, a lot of the work is done by the patients and their families and to become active managers in their healthcare. And so, but self-management self helps people with limb loss and limb difference get the training and skills to do the work of recovery and maximizing quality of life. And we know from our research and learning from patients and families, there are four things that really make a difference in terms of self-management. That is knowledge, knowing about my condition and what I need to do to care for it. People who are good at problem solving, Developing some specific skills like relaxation to calm the mind and body, being able to manage negative thoughts, being able to be assertive with my healthcare team and insurers, and then keeping track of how I'm doing with self monitoring on a regular basis, and then feeling empowered to make a difference. Self management and, and uh, programs like promoting amputee life skills, they're not a substitute for clinical care. They're a foundational component in addition to clinical care. Next slide. So we've done some studies, some, some of you may participate in these studies to look at what's the impact of people doing PALS and doing PALS online. And we've measured a number of these things in these studies. And let me just go to the next slide and tell you what we found. What we find is that people who do programs like PALS online they have significant improvement in their self-efficacy or another way of saying confidence in managing their care. They feel more activated and engaged in their care. Their anxiety tends to go down. Their depression tends to go down. Their positive feelings tend to go up. They tend to do more things and participate more fully in life and have higher life satisfaction. You know, and the participants tell us that these changes aren't just statistically significant, they are meaningful in their lives. And perhaps in addition to that, the other most important thing is that people enjoy doing the program once they get into it. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia. And some of you may know Tricia Kirkhart <laughs> from our many presentations at the Amputee Coalition or in the exhibit hall. Uh, she is the person who has developed and managed PALS online over the past few years. And if you ever want to talk to about Trisha about something really important, <laughs> talk to her about pugs because she's a great <laughs> lover of all things pug. So Trisha, you take, you take it from here. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to give a brief overview about PALS and sort of remind people the what it's in it, what's in it. So PALS right now has a core 
of eight lessons, and it's designed to improve quality of life for people with limb loss and limb different. Right now, we are building an additional lesson which deals with work after limb loss, and that's currently being developed, and Dr. Kessler is going to talk about that in a few minutes. And originally, as Dr. Wegener had said, PALS course was available in person, and then we moved it online and we um, conducted it as a study. But we have now um, have opened it up so it's self-registration. You don't have to participate in the study. You go to the website, you self-register, and you start the process. So everything is much easier. And with PALS, you can learn to practice self-management skills like problem solving, goal setting, relaxation, communication. And most importantly, you can develop your own personal self-management plan. Um, for those of you that want to use PALS in your support group, we also have a support leader's guide to help you facilitate the discussions of the lessons in that support group. And this is just a screenshot of the homepage for PALS. And what I want to alert people to is the big register now button in the middle of the page. If you want to participate in PALS, click on that button, you register for the site, and then it is up to you. It's self-guided and it's up to you. Right now, we are working on, as we said, um, building the life you want work after limb loss. But over time, we want to add additional lessons as well, which we can talk about towards the end of this in the discussion section. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kessler. So let me let me just make one comment, Tricia. Two things I think are important. The first thing we need to remind people: it's free. There's no charge. Oh, of course. Anymore. I'm sorry. It's free. <laughs> and and what you put into PAL stays anonymous. Only only you can see your answers. Nobody at the amputee coalition, no one at Johns Hopkins can see any of your answer. It's a private course for you to do on on your own. So. Um, let us now um, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Molly Kessler. She is assistant professor here at Johns Hopkins, the department of PM&R. She's a physiatrist who specializes in care of people of, ampute of amputees and limb difference. Um, mm -hmm. But watch her screen carefully because she has a couple of cats and they may make a cameo <laughs> appearance on the cat. So yeah, if they break through the door, who knows? Keep your eye out for the cats. Go ahead, take it away, Molly. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, so as Trisha mentioned, I'm going to be just reviewing some of the content we have for this new lesson. And the first thing to think about is why do people work? Um, most people do have do something to give their life meaning. And when we think about work, there are many reasons why people work. They could be to pay bills, take care of their families, or give meaning and purpose to their life. And after having an amputation, um, this requires adaptation and change to your major life activity, as well as other aspects of your life. So when thinking about returning to work, it is purely a personal decision. And so some people, um, returning to work is an option to be considered, while for others, it's a necessity. For some people, taking care of their health becomes their full-time job, and for that, they receive disability payments. For others, limb loss has changed their priorities and they choose to focus on spending time with their families. Some people are returned to their usual pre-limb loss activities, such as work, and in some cases, they return to work in a different way, whereas others may continue to run into barriers and challenges and may even experience long-term limitations in their ability to participate in meaningful activities. But everyone's path is different. The first thing to consider when you're wondering about returning to work is, am I emotionally and physically ready? There are various questions you may wanna ask yourself to try to come up with that answer, such as, will I be okay with people looking at me or asking questions about my amputation? Will I be okay returning to work using an assisted device? If I wear a prosthesis, can I wear it all day? How am I getting to work? And am I physically and emotionally ready to focus on my work? As well as some other questions, but those are just a sampling. It is also helpful to take stock of the situation. It's important to think about what's the same and what's different regarding returning to work, as well as thinking of the pros and cons of making that choice. And it can be useful to revisit that pros and cons list repeatedly 
to make changes and update it as you learn more about yourself in this decision. People find it useful to hear from other people with living with limb loss who have made this same decision, whatever the outcome is. Um, just hearing from their experience and what they've gone through can be useful. So in addition to having your making your own self-assessment, it can be in thinking, spending time thinking to, uh, through these questions yourself, it can be useful to reach out to other people and other resources, such as talking with family and those who are important to you, talking with your healthcare team, understanding your rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, talking with your employer, as well as reviewing available resources. So it can be useful talk, to talk with your family and those important to you because they know you very well and they care a lot about you. So there, we have a whole selection of questions that you may consider asking your friends or family, but I will review a couple, such as how important is it to us for me to return to work or can we make it on what we have? Do we have the resources necessary for me to return to work? What, and what do, you, what do you all think is the next step for me? It's useful to reach out to the people who know you well to get their thoughts and take that into account when you're making your decision. You may also wanna to talk to your healthcare team, such as your physician or your prosthetist. And you can ask, am I physically ready to return to work? Should I go back part-time or full-time? Do I need accommodations? And then there's some things you may want to think about your potential job to, and let your team, medical team know, like, am I going to have to do heavy lifting? And if so, how heavy? Am I going to have to do a lot of walking, standing or sitting? Am I going to have to walk on wet surfaces? Am I going to potentially be sprayed by chemicals or have to walk on gravel? Those are things that your medical team may want to know. So that way they make sure you have the tools um, and things necessary to return to your job safely and successfully. And whenever we're talking about returning to work after a life changing or event, it's important to keep in mind the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA became law in 1990 and it prohibits discrimination against those with disabilities in all aspects of public life, including jobs. So it guarantees an equal opportunity for people with disabilities. So employers can't discriminate against qualified individuals based on their disability. So assuming that the individual is a qualified individual, that means they can do the job, the essential aspects of the job with or without reasonable accommodation. The employer must provide those reasonable accommodations unless they would cause undue hardship. This is an interactive process. It's collaborative between the employer and the employee. And so it requires a lot of good communication. So when you're talking with your employer, it's helpful to be proactive and communicate early. It's helpful to keep them in the loop so they are aware of your progress and your plan for returning to work. And as, as we reviewed, it's important to know your rights and to try to clearly uh, make, uh, make those requests as clear as possible to your employer. We have a list of some available resources that may be helpful when going through this process. The big one obviously being the Amputee Coalition, which Caitlin will dive into a bit more in a bit. Um, some other ones are Ticket to Work, What Color Is My Parachute, which is a career decision-making workbook, um, Goodwill, Easter Seals, Vocational Rehab, just to name a few. So ultimately, you have to decide what's the best path for you. Is it returning to prior work, making a change by getting a new job, or developing a new life, life activity? And we'll review all three of those paths. So if you, if, if you go the path of returning to prior work, there are a few questions you may wanna ask yourself. What are the things I'm able to do easily? What are the things I'll need accommodations for? Or is there anything I, are there things I won't be able to do even with accommodations? So as I mentioned earlier, it's helpful to be proactive with your employer to have these discussions early. Sometimes people find it useful to write things down so that way they don't forget things. And it can be useful, so it can be useful to write down what you need accommodations for and why. Doesn't have to be a novel, it just something brief so that way 
you remember and your employer remembers and so you can have, so there's less risk of miscommunication. If you're thinking about getting a new job, you may wanna ask some of those same questions as if you were returning to your prior job. But you'll also wanna ask yourself, what am I looking for in a new job? What skills do I have? What do I enjoy doing? And who, who can I talk to or where can I learn more about a new job opportunity or possibility? Sometimes people have to return to school to get additional education or training for a new job. It can be useful to reach out to that school or institution's disability service office to see what accommodations are already in place or just to make yourself aware before getting started. And it's also important to remember that the ADA doesn't just apply to jobs and employment, but it also applies to schools. And then for the third path, you may choose to pursue a new life activity. This could be something like becoming an amputee coalition certified peer visitor, other forms of volunteer work, home management, caring for a family member, or managing your own health care. Some people decide to return to school for just for their own interest. And again, it's important to remember that you have the disability service office available as well as the ADA there to protect you. This process isn't easy. For many people, the process of returning to their old, old job or finding a new one is hard, and sometimes people lose their way. And you may need to go down multiple paths or the same paths multiple times in different ways. So when sometimes people lose their way, they can have different warning signs. Could be inactivity, depression, illegal substance use, alcohol and or tobacco overuse, becoming irritable or short-tempered, or changes in your behavior that lead to worsening relationships with family and friends. If, you, if you're worried that you've lost your way or someone else may be going down the wrong path, it can be useful to review past PALS um, lessons in, on developing coping strategies, going back into PALS and looking through the toolbox where there's information about support groups, getting a peer mentor and connecting with mental health resources Reaching out to family, friends, and spiritual leaders can be helpful as well. And then don't forget that the, your healthcare provider team can help you find the find assistance you need. It's as a reminder, returning to meaningful life activities and work takes time. It takes months, possibly years, often longer than you expect. And it's key to be patient with yourself through the process. So with that. I'm going to pass the baton to Caitlin, but I'll let Dr. Wagner introduce her. Thank you very much, Molly. Before we go on, I'm just going to ask you something. And, you know, in your, um, in, we have, we're good on time, so I just want to ask you a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. as, as, you, as you've worked with patients in your practice um, and have seen people pursuing these different paths, you know, what kind, what kind of obstacles do you see them running up against as they think about going back to their old job? And what kind of act actions have you seen patients take to, you know, overcome the, uh, in, uh, in conversations with their employers? How, what, what have you seen there that maybe you could share with us that people have found effective um, in, in, that, yeah. in that process? I think one of the common things that I see in the people I work with is in initially being fearful of that returning to work process, um, especially if they have or have newly lost a limb. There, there's so much going on, and so I, I think it's helpful when for people to break down the process. Um, and what I, what I've I've found the most success when people have communicated openly with their employers, um, talking to them about what's going on what, um, and what accommodations they need. When people have been able, some people are able to work from home initially if their job allows. And I think that has helped people be successful in returning to the workplace. So it sounds like one of the things you're articulating is communicating with people not being not being avoidant in that conversation to get to communicate mm -hmm. early and often and mm -hmm. not and i think and sometimes yeah i think sometimes people 
um, that some people I've worked with think they may, they may be thinking about all of the things they are looking to accomplish, which can be overwhelming where, and cause they're simply, they're just starting to learn how to use their prosthesis and they're, and they're also thinking about returning to work. So I think sometimes it's helpful when any of us are faced with such a situation to take a step back and think about one thing at a time or piecemeal. So that way it doesn't feel like such an overwhelming process. Good. So maybe if we have time at the end, we'll come back and maybe hear some hear from some people in the chat as what kind mm -hmm. of barriers. And if, if you're online, maybe you can share in the chat some of the barriers you've experienced or some of the problems you're facing. We can get people on the panel to kind of think with you about those issues. So let's uh, take it back to, um, to Caitlin from the MPT Coalition. Caitlin is the manager of the National Limb Loss Resource Center. And I suspect many people who are <laughs> in this room with us right now have interacted with the National Limb Loss Resource Center in one way or the other, requesting information, connecting for peer support, you know, signing up for one program or the other through the Limb Loss Resource Center. So it's great to have Caitlin with us. I, I we're looking around your house there, Caitlin. Caitlin was talking before in our break before we got started that she's a serious nerd, <laughs> and that particularly in the area of Star Wars. And she says she has a part room of her house just is full of Star Wars paraphernalia. But evidently, you're not broadcasting from that room today, Caitlin. You're broadcasting from some other room. Yeah, I don't like to throw that out for everybody. To see. <laughs> but, uh, but we would like to see it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think. Next, next year when we're online, we're gonna, we expect to broadcast from the Star Wars room. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Yeah, um, the Resource Center team at the Amputee Coalition, we do get um, calls and inquiries about um, the process of returning to work pretty often. So um, we have developed several resources that can help um, supporting individuals in the return to work. Um, we have created a comprehensive fact sheet that includes several different resources to help in returning to work. Um, these resources are geared toward members of the disability community. Um, some of the resources listed are federal programs, while others are state and local programs. Um, we have also included private organizations that assist the disability community with returning to work. And there are also programs listed on that fact sheet that help veterans and also college students or recent graduates in their job search. Um, and on that note, uh, the Resource Center also has a fact sheet that lists um, college funding opportunities for individuals in the disability community. And we are looking at creating one um, that's geared more towards vocation vocational school in the future. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, another great resource is Community Connections. Uh, we were so excited to launch this online searchable database earlier this spring. Um, this has been a project that has been in the works for a few years now. For, so for us to finally launch it, it was, it was great. Um, Community Connections is, it allows individuals to self-serve by entering their zip code to find national, state-based, and local resources. Um, and you can also filter the resources by topic. And there are such topics as employment counseling and employment training that you can filter by. Um, this is an ongoing, ever-evolving resource that um, we continually research and locate new resources to add across the country. Um, we also do host several webinars each year. Um, one of the webinars that we hosted in the past, and that is on our website, so that you can go on and watch the recording, is in conjunction with the Job Accommodation Network. Um, this webinar explains how to work with your employer to make it possible to do your job with limb loss or limb difference. Um, and we do have plans to do more employment-focused webinars in the future. We do announce our webinars through our email list and on our social media, so if you would like to know about any upcoming webinars, please make sure you sign up for our e-blast or follow us on social media so you'll know whenever those are um, coming down the pike. Um, one thing that I forgot to include on the slide um, about returning to work information is we have a section in First Step. Um, for anybody who's um, listening in that is not familiar with First Step, it is one of our premier publications and it's a guide to adapting to limb loss. 
Um, there is a whole section in the book dedicated to living well with limb loss and includes information on returning to work in that section. Um, you do also always have the option to connect with one of our certified information and referral specialists. And there are several ways to do that. You can call us at our toll-free number, reach out through the Ask an Information Specialist form on our website, or you can even reach out to us through our free support app. Um, our specialists can try to help point you in the right direction, not only with resources and helping to return to work, but a wide range of topics. Um, we do try to find resources not only on the national or state level, but we really try to emphasize resources at the local level if possible. So if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We will try to help in any way that we can. Um, the National Limb Loss Resource Center team is manning the APT Coalition info booth in the exhibit hall. So if you would like to chat with one of us virtually, either this afternoon or evening or tomorrow, um, stop on by. We'll be happy to chat with you. But uh, thanks for your time, and I hope everyone's enjoying conference. Thank you, Caitlin. I mean, let me just uh, ask a couple questions of you. Um, in your experience in the Limb Law Center, what do you think, what kind of common pieces of information do people request or what, what are common calls related to the whole return to work, return to school, um, return to meaningful life activity area? What kind of things do people call up or ask about or have questions about in general? Maybe some uh, of our listeners have some same, similar questions. A lot of the time it's about um, what their rights are and what they can ask for in regards of reasonable accommodations. So we try to um, get people in touch with their regional ADA office or their state disability rights office. Um, we actually get quite a few calls about um, individuals um, getting their their CDL license, the, commercial driving license. So we have put some time and effort and that's another thing we may be looking at doing a fact sheet in regards to how to get your CDL after having an amputation. So that one has actually, I've been with the coalition for five years. That question has come up more in the past two years than my entire time working there. So what do you, what do you make of that? What do you make about people in recent times being interested in the CDL work? You know, I don't know. Um, I maybe because there's more need for CDL licensing. Um, I'm not sure. It's just I noticed a trend in that uh, probably about two years ago. It started picking up to where we really needed to put some brain cells towards um, coming up with information and being able to direct people to find either they're in their state because every every state's laws are different. So it's trying to get people in touch with the correct offices that's going to give them the correct information in their state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a, a very interesting development. Um, it's, a, it's very exciting as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA this year mm -hmm. to see people moving into new careers and trying new and have an expansion and having obviously employers interested in quality people, whether they have limb difference or limb loss or not. And that's, exactly. That's, that's very exciting. Yes, very, that's very exciting. So it's, it also sounds like you also get a lot of questions about ADA related questions in terms of what people's rights are under the law and what they can and can't do. And yes. What they, and, what, and what they can reasonably expect as an accommodation. Right. You know, given your calls and the people you talk to in the center, what and maybe Dr. Kessler might want to jump in on this is what are the kind of common uh, accommodations that people end up asking for. And I, I welcome your comments about this too, Dr. Kessler, in terms of what are the common accommodations people often ask for. Maybe we'll hear from Caitlin first and then you, Molly. So Caitlin, what kind of accommodations are people inquiring about? Um, well, I know um, we've had some calls where um, we've had to refer them to their local, you know, ADA or um, disability rights because their employer um, wouldn't let them sit down like if they're in a manufacturing job and if you're on a prosthesis all day, um, that can sometimes be very challenging. So um, I know having breaks to where they can rest um, a little bit. Um, being able to use their wheelchair at work. Um, I was on a, 
I was on the plenary earlier today and I actually saw several questions coming through um, about how I believe one individual was a teacher and um, was wondering if she could, if it was okay for her to ask the school to use the wheelchair. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, but I did see that question come through. Um, and we, we kind of chimed in and said, you know, please come by the info booth so we can try to get you directed to the correct resources. Okay. okay. And, and, and Molly, how about you? Yeah. What kind of thing do your patients talk, talk to you about in terms of requesting accommodations? I think the most common is the one that Caitlin mentioned about rest breaks. So taking seated breaks, like how long do they have to stand? Um, and another thing that I've spoken to people about is having skin breaks. So having it, the having the space to take their prosthesis off if needed. Um, mm -hmm. So those have been the most common things that I've seen. And what's been re employers' responses to those things? Have you? Have your, have your patients encountered a lot of resistance? Are, are people, are, are, I expect it's a varied response, but what, are you, are, do you see any trends or do you draw Thankfully, you thankfully the, um, the, people I, the people with limb loss I've been working with have had supportive employers. Um, they typically are employers that they were working for lead, prior to their amputation who were e eager and supportive to bring them back. So thankfully it's been, They've been happy stories generally so that's great to hear that's great to hear mm -hmm. so let me uh finish up in the next few minutes the slides that we have and then we'll be looking at the chat for questions for the panel and for us to think about so as you've heard um the pals online the basic sessions as trisha said are up available and free and you can start doing those tonight just in fact just leave this session and go there register and just start doing them if you haven't um, where we are right now with the limb loss um, module is we hope to have this up by the end of the year available on the, on the, uh, as, a, as a supplemental lesson to the basic lessons. We're, we're, we're a little bit, and we're we'll interested in your feedback on this in the audience is we're a little bit tied up by COVID, right? So um, we have our modules built, but if you've done PALS or if you haven't done PALS, what you'll come to see is that they're very video rich. That is, we have a lot of people with limb loss and limb different talking about their experience with various things, whether it's managing pain or managing depression or working with their healthcare team in basic PALS. But of course, in this one, we're going to have people talking about what was their journey about going back to work or what, how they decided to go in a different pathway or how they went back to school. And so we're gonna have people talking about these various paths and the various barriers that they encountered because we know, and the people who help us build PALS are people with limb loss and limb difference. They tell us is, we wanna hear from other people like me. Uh, Dr. Kessler is really smart. Caitlin has a lot of information, but they wanna hear from people like me. And so the programs in PALS are very video rich. And of course, in the COVID environment, we are not able to film in person now. So if you're on, one of the questions we have for you as participants in this conversation, which I wish we were having face to face, but we're gonna to have to have some comments in the chat is, what do you think we should do? Do you think we should put up some temporary videos that we may have to do on Zoom with people? So the video quality won't be so good, but we'll have them up in there and get pal, pals work, return to work lesson out there as soon as possible, maybe with videos that aren't quite as good, or do you think we should wait until we can get the really high quality videos that we usually have, which would probably cause us to delay until early next year. So if you could weigh in on the chat on those two possible options, we don't think putting it up without any videos at all would be all that educational or enriching or engaging. So we're, we're thinking about going with temporary videos in the short run and then going move to professional done ones later on or should we wait for the professional ones so go into the chat and maybe somebody can be looking in the chat and seeing what kinds of things are coming up while i talk about this next topic and the next topic is we are going to be building adi other additional lessons so we have the eight basic lessons now we're going to have the new um work after limb loss lesson 
we've done some conversations with people who have advised us on PALS, and the ones that they've suggested, there are three ideas that have come forward thus far. The first one is a PALS lesson on, on intimacy after limb loss. That would, address, that would address issues of relationship, intimacy, sexuality, that all of us as human beings have, but if you have limb loss and limb difference, there are nuances to the navigating these relationships and these intimacies. And so one suggestion we have is to have a, build our next lesson on that. Another suggestion we've had is to have do one on body image. Obviously, when one grows up with a limb difference or one experiences an amputation along the course of life, this changes and can change how we see ourselves, how others see us, how we respond to other people and how they see us and how we come to accept who we are as a person, right? Now, all of us have to accept various things about ourselves, but that's a, it's a unique journey if you're living with limb loss or limb difference. And so that's another possible lesson we can focus on. Are the cats coming, Molly? <laughs> I didn't know if the cats were coming. I thought maybe they were coming. Um, and then the other, another one we talked about was suggested to us was recreational and sports after limb loss. Now, of course, we have a lot of people in the amputation community who are Paralympic athletes, running marathons, doing every possible thing. And most of us aren't running marathons and aren't Paralympic athletes any more than we're uh, doing marathons or being Olympians in, in the able-bodied world, uh, temporarily able-bodied world, as I like to say. Um, so, but this would be a lesson more around general recreation and general leisure activities after limb loss. And so we'd be interested to hear from you in the chat as to which one of these things you think should be our highest priority as a team next, or maybe you have a better idea, <laughs> which, you know, all of our ideas for all the lessons of PALS have come from you all. This is, you know, this all started off like 15 years ago in a support group meeting in New York City. And people said, we ought to have a class you could go to to learn about how to be a person with a limb loss. And then we, somebody said, that's a good idea. And then we spent six months talking to people about what ought to be in the, in the class, which became PALS. And that's the same methods we follow now. So if you have ideas about lessons we should have, let's see those in the chat. So what kind of things are the panelists seeing in the chat now? I, I'm, I can't chat and talk. So what are you all seeing in the chat now? Well, Caitlin, we have a question for you. Um, is the newest edition of First Step available in Spanish? It is not currently. However, we are in the process of getting um, the newest edition translated into Spanish. When do you expect it to be out, Caitlin, would you say? I, I, I'm not 100% sure. No, that's, that's, you, aren't, you aren't the managers of First Step. You're the manager of the Limbaugh Center. Right. <laughs> that would be more of a Dan question. So. Well, if somebody sees Dan in, in one of these chats somewhere, you should pin him down and ask him when Spanish, Spanish, um, Spanish First Step is coming out. And I will anticipate the question that we occasionally get is, is PALS available in Spanish? And Tricia, what's the answer to that? The answer is, is that it will be. We are in the works. So you, you look, keep your eyes out. Um, we're, it is we're, a goal for the next two years to transition. Right. So that, that's something we hope to have out, that, we, that we're planning to have out in collaboration with the Limit with the Amputation. And I would love to, de to debut it in two years in person at the national meeting. <laughs> yep. We'll look That'd forward to that. What other kind of things are you all seeing in the chat? Are we getting any feedback on my questions about which should be the priority about Zoom videos or regular videos? Not yet. Uh, Not okay. yet. Okay. Well, you can be in the chat for a while yet, but uh, our tendency is to um, think about, you know, potentially using, if we will, temporary videos in the short run because who we don't know how long it could be before professional videos are going to be done. We'll yeah, before we can before we can film live and in person in a, in a safe way. So um, I think we'll probably make that decision in the next month or so, and then go from there, depending on what we see in terms of 
the current uh, COVID situation in terms of, if that appears to be abating quickly, that may allow us the opportunity to make professional videos. If not, we may have to go come out with uh, temporary ones and then do that. But certainly um, feel free to jump on the PALS uh, program now and do the basics. And so you're ready when the um, work one comes out I, I, because you, you can't take the additional ones until you take basic classes. So you got, got, got to get got to get your introductory class out of the way before you can mm -hmm. take the advanced one. So start working yep. on, the, on, on the PALS now. I will say one other thing and then open the panel up for final comments is that um, a number of support group leaders have done PALS with their support groups. And what people do is they have people work the lessons on their own privately. When the group meets on a monthly basis, they come together and discuss the lessons that have been done. And a lot of support group leaders have really enjoyed that. And we have a discussion guide to facilitate that. Yes, exactly. And also a lot of the peer visitors now, when they're making basic peer visits, are giving people the information about PALS so to supplement their peer visitor mentorship to have the patients uh, and, and patients probably at that time, but people with limb loss later on to do their um, to do their basic training in PALS. That's so we do job. we do have a question about finding a job during the pandemic that you can do from home. Any ideas or thoughts from the panel? Interesting. Molly, are you, are you hearing anything from your patients about looking in, in the current crisis? Um, we may have lost Molly. I know. I think we might have lost audio. We may have lost Molly's audio. So, um, Caitlin, are you getting any calls now about people looking for, in the, in the, in the current crisis, looking for work? And what are you hearing there at the Limb Law Center? Yeah, um, like any tips or thoughts? Well, I, I don't believe we've gotten too many calls um, regarding looking for a job while the pandemic is going on. Um, I, I guess probably what I would suggest first of all is maybe um, stop by our info booth or contact us so we can get you that employment resources fact sheet. Um, I know a lot of agencies, either state-based or national agencies, have been um, cranking out a lot of different tips and um, tips and tricks during the pandemic. So um, we would be happy to get that information out to you guys. I will say one thing before we come, to, we have one more minute left. I do think employers are going to get more flexible people working from home. We, you know, you look at the panel, we're all at home. I think. Um, so I think p employers are going to get more flexible about people working from home and doing all kinds of work from home that we mostly thought had to be done in the office, but no longer is the case. So, um, you know, now is a tough time to look for jobs with employment the way it is. But as the economy begins to come back after the first year, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's going to be a lot of employee, uh, more employer flexibility about working from home. I see that it's four o'clock and we're going to get kicked off in favor of somebody else. Thanks to the panel, Tricia, Caitlin, and Molly for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us. We had quite a good crowd and we're very pleased and we hope to see you next year, either in person or 